This short video lesson will allow you to debrief on your electrolyte lab we conducted with the use of a conductivity meter. We had three categories of compounds, category A, B, and C, in which we placed a conductivity meter and just simply had to record the value given to us from our, our calculator-based chemistry. When I take a look at the solutions from part A, the first one, calcium chloride, CaCl2. When we place the conductivity meter, and I'm giving you about approximate values, when I conducted the experiment, I saw a value of about 9,362. I'm not asking you to change what you saw. Each conductivity meter, meter is going to give us a unique value. They were not calibrated for each other. But all we're looking to do is to compare the values from one meter to the next. We placed aluminum chloride, AlCl3, and sodium chloride, NaCl. So for category A, three different ionic compounds. Calcium chloride, about 9362. Aluminum chloride, 15214 and sodium chloride 11707. To repeat, these numbers are important. It's the magnitude when we compare them that I find very important. Part B, we place the conductivity meter into acetic acid, hydrochloric acid, phosphoric acid, and oxalic acid. Acetic, hydrochloric, phosphoric, and oxalic acid made up the compounds for part B. Notice these were all acids. These guys were ionic compounds. Now out of this list, I suspect hydrochloric to be quite significantly high because it indeed is one of the seven strong acids that we're working towards memorizing. And again, I'll give some values for you to just compare the magnitude When I conducted, this is the values that I found, and you probably had some sort of reading for oxalic acid. This would be suspect, but it was significantly slow. Oxalic acid is a very weak, hardly ionizes at all, giving us a very low number for conductivity. HCl is very strong, giving us a very high value of conductivity. The last set, we had these molecules, molecular compounds, which we would know to be um, non-conductors. So again, if you saw some sort of reading, I'm sure it was just because I mixed the solutions in a water solvent from the tap water. The tap water, of course, we know has dissolved ions in it. I have some sort of small reading for tap water and comparatively significantly small numbers down here. With molecular compounds, we know these to be non-conductors, very significantly small number. We have acids that are either strong or weak. And up here we have ionic compounds that are all strong electro electrolytes, and our numbers are verifying that as well. Interestingly enough, before I turn over and share some answers here, I noticed that the number of particles that would dissociate also plays a role in the value that I've recorded. For instance, when calcium chloride dissociates, breaks apart into its ions, I realize that I'm going to get a total of three ions in solution, one calcium and two chlorides. When aluminum chloride dissociates, I'm going to get a total of four ions, one aluminum and three chlorides. And here, sodium chloride lets go into two ions, one sodium and one chloride. Notice how our conductivity readings verified that the more ions we have in solution, four, then three, then two, the higher the conductivity, the brighter the bulb would indeed glow. So again, just comparing some numbers, yours don't have to match exactly, but we get an idea that we have these three different categories, ionic salts, molecular compounds, and in this tweener area, strong and weak acids. Let's take a peek at some of your processing questions I wanted you to uh, be able to check over. Again, I assume that you've done yours and are simply checking. Alrighty. Number one, 
Based on your conductivity values, do group A compounds appear to be molecular, ionic, or molecular acids? And would you expect them to be partially dissociated, completely dissociated, or not dissociated at all? Well, we've commented on that already, and I'll just put my answer here. We said that these compounds in group A are indeed ionic. They completely dissociate in water. That's the very definition of a strong electrolyte, 100% dissociate. Why do the group A compounds, each with the same concentrations, have a large difference in conductivity values? And write those equations for dissociation here. Well, again, commenting about the number of ions that came out. Aluminum chloride dissociated into four moles of ions. We get one aluminum, aqueous ion of plus three, three chlorides, aqueous ions of chloride with a minus one, four moles total. We saw that they had the largest number for conductivity. When calcium chloride dissociated, we showed that with one calcium ion aqueous and two chloride ions aqueous. Boy, oh boy, I'm trying to stress, be very careful you're putting your charges on these dissociation reactions. The smallest reading for the strong electrolytes gave off the fewest number of ions, which was ordinary table salt, sodium chloride. So because aluminum chloride dissociated to yield the largest number of ions, then we saw calcium chloride and sodium chloride respectively. So the more ions, the, more, the higher the conductivity. Part B. In group B, do all four compounds appear to be molecular, ionic, or acids? We called those acids, didn't we? Classify each as strong or weak and arrange them from the strongest to the weakest based on their conductivity values. I made a note that we're working to memorize the seven strong acids and that's the only purpose of this margin note over here. To recognize the strong acids would be very helpful. Sulfuric, H2SO4. Nitric, HNO3. Hydrochloric, HCl. Hydrobromic, HBr hydroiodic, HI, chloric, and perchloric, respectively. If any of our acids were one of these seven, we recognize it to be strong. And if they are not, they must be weak. So looking at our data in group B, all were molecular acids, HCl is considered strong. Although phosphoric acid did give us a number that's borderline strong. It was quite a, a nice conductor. Acetic acid and oxalic acid were very weak. Again, let's verify by reminding ourselves of some of those numbers. C phosphoric acid did give us a, a, a significant reading. Acetic acid not so much, and oxalic acid probably the least. Strong, eh, borderline strong, and then definitely the weak category for weak molecular acids. Write the equation for the dissociation for those compounds in group B. Remember to use equilibrium arrows where appropriate. The only time we did not need an equilibrium arrow was for that strong hydrochloric acid, HCl. One arrow pointing 100% to the right. 100% of those dissociate into ions. However, phosphoric, acetic, and oxalic acids have equilibrium arrows to show that some dissociated into ions, but the vast majority did indeed stay as a molecule, giving us the definition of weak. Notice what I've done with phosphoric. I exaggerated the equilibrium arrows to show it did give quite a significant value for conductivity, so I'm pointing more favorably to the right in terms of conducting with ions than to the left non-conducting molecules. I exaggerate over here with acetic acid hardly pointing to the right at all and I exaggerate with oxalic acid hardly dissociating at all because we had very low readings for conductivity. The equilibrium values can be expressed with the length of the arrow. One other comment here 
Be sure that we're only ionizing one hydrogen at a time. The Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases will be practicing that again, but when an acid dissociates, it lets go of just one hydrogen ion step by step. So do not take all three of them off, but just simply take one off for phosphoric acid, leaving you the dihydrogen phosphate polyatomic ion. Same here with this diprotic acid, known as oxalic acid. Simply take one hydrogen off, leaving you the hydrogen oxalate polyatomic ion. Ions are aqueous. Number five. For phosphoric acid and oxalic acid, this is our triprotic and our diprotic, right here. Does the subscript on the hydrogen in these two formulas seem to result in additional ions and explain? And I just talked about that. We only take one hydrogen ion off only. So the subscript contrib contributes little to their strength. Polyprotic acids only release one hydrogen ion. So to emphasize the number of ions for strong versus weak, it doesn't matter how many H's they have out front because it only breaks apart into two ions, one positive hydrogen and one negative anion. Polyprotic acids only let go of one hydrogen in a stepwise fashion. So the number of particles is constant the length of the arrow is being used to show the strength of conductivity. Let's talk about group C. For all four compounds to appear to be molecular, ionic, or acids. And we did indeed label compound in group C to be molecular, nonmetals hooked together, not made of any charged particles at all. Therefore, these non-electrolytes do not dissociate. There are no ions to break apart. How do you explain the relatively high conductivity of tap water to zero conductivity of distilled water? Again, the water that comes out of our sink contains dissolved ions, impurities, such as hard metals as calcium ions, magnesium ions. We add fluoride and chloride. Even the bicarbonate ion is used to help purify water as it travels through our pipes. All kinds of dissolved ions that are found in tap water. Distilled water, by the very definition, does not contain any impurities. 100% H2O with no dissolved ions, therefore it should have zero conductivity. In our last question, how did aqueous methanol have the same conductivity value as aqueous ethylene glycol. Explain. Did they have? Well, they had approximately the same conductivity value because both were non-electrolytes. Both of these non-electrolytes did not dissociate significantly. One thing I noticed, and I'll go back and kind of repair that. On this side, I stopped writing out the formulas. We could certainly do that. Water, of course, H2O. Tap water is H2O. Remember that we did see some of those dissolved ions in tap water, so we saw some sort of uh, conductivity. Methanol, of course, had um, it's an alcohol group, which we learned about over the summer assignment. Ends in OH. Methanol has one carbon with an OH functional group. And ethylene glycol, C2H6O2. Hydrocarbon chemistry, these are polar molecules, so they do dissolve well in water, but because they do not dissociate, they're not built of any ions, we see a very, you might have seen some number up here, but a very small non-electrolytic conductivity value. When you have your lab perfect, give yourself an A+. Hold on to it till the next time we meet in class. We'll be turning those in.